This is George. His real name is Mumbles, but I named him George before I found out his name. And I really like calling him George. So even though his name is Mumbles, and even though there's another uh, rhino with him at the zoo whose name is George, I'm stubborn. Hi. Um, this is how I make, still have to make the voiceovers for, um, for my videos, uh, because I don't really have a better mic set up right now than to do it through my camera and then just take the pictures off and put them on here. So I'm following my computer with what I have set up with my scrolling images. This is the uh, Art Lover video, the George, the expanded version that goes more deeply into how I painted it and what the choices were and looking at the details of actually painting. So I have set up my movie on my screen top here, my images, and given them approximate times and some, put titles in just to remind myself of some of my talking points. And then I'm going to start it and I'm going to start narration. And hopefully we can, that the two with editing and blending will, uh, uh, will meld perfectly. So <laughs> here's my Bob again. So I went to the Houston Zoo in uh, June of 2015. And among all the animals, the endangered species that I photographed there, they had three white rhinos. And the rhinos habitat never really allowed me to get very close to them. And I don't have the same sense of, um, of having met them in the way that you, when you're with an ape and an ape is looking you in the eyes, you have a sense that this animal is recognizing you. In the first place, rhino's vision is terrible, so it couldn't have seen me. So in the, in the morning when I went there, well, the, th the benefit about going to a zoo and spending day after day or going to a zoo and, you know, going, going there quite often is you begin to learn which animals are out where when. The rhinos in the morning were up in the, in the t higher part of their habitat where they were further away from me, but where they were largely uh, feasting on uh, hey. Later in the afternoon when it got hotter, they were over in this place which offered the little, the little bit of shade that they had in their habitat. And uh, as you can see, they actually share this habitat, which I had forgotten completely until I saw this photo. And I think that is a kudu. I think it's either a lesser kudu or a female kudu, which you can tell the hump on the back with that little fur. But anyway, it's nice when animals can cohabitat can cohabitate. Now look at how many textures are on this rhino. It is just beautiful. It's organic. It's like, I love the Japanese tradition of wabi-sabi, which where the old and the worn and the tarnished is, I find great beauty in that. And so of course I find great beauty in a rhino skin. Can you see the horse? Rhinos are part of a very small family called odd toed ungulates, which are, there's only three parts to that family. The rhinos, all the rhinos are in one class and uh, all the tapers are in another class. And in the first class are horses who are one toed. So that makes them odd toed ungulates. The pose. So I really like many things about this photograph I have, but the fact that his jaw and the completion to his legs is hidden in the grass and I don't have enough reference material otherwise and meant that I did not want to use this one. Also, I don't, I try very hard not to introduce things like grasses or branches or things into my photos, into my paintings. Because I am, part of the purpose of the, uh, the dark backgrounds on my painting is to take place out of the equation. Setting is not part of this. So that's why I don't really want his head in grass at the bottom. So this is the image that I chose. But I actually tweaked it a little bit with some reference I got from some other places. But this is the, this is George. And there were some things about the eye in this one, but this one I didn't have the leg reference or the, you know, the right 
leg reference or the hind leg reference, but oh, look at how much I had. And then this is how I cropped it and then made it. I go and get the thing blown up in black and white and, uh, and print it to the size and test the scale and then go from there. I love this painting for very many reasons. I love with how far I got with how little, uh, because there was a lot of palette knife work and a lot of texture in this. Much of that is serendipity. You just sort of have to make the stroke and hope that something comes out interesting when you're done, but you can't rework it, uh, at least not without letting it dry and then going back and working it again. But all of this palette knife work up here, I love how this turned out. I also am in love with the colors here. So there's a green in here and there's pinks in here and there's Bob in here. Yes. <laughs> um, and then all the textures in here, there's, I used pressed in textures here and up here, which are finer great and you'll be able to see in the following video. And then other textures that I literally just painted in this kind of thing and then other ones I carved in with a with the tip of my palette knife or the end of a brush in some of these places but this painting ultimately relies a lot on serendipity just the way that these things fell out and uh, I'm very excited about that so we'll go into the detail of how I painted them This is just 12 stages along the way, and actually there's a final finished photo after this. But you can see, this is the just drawing in the line, basically setting the line. My first layer of my background in this one, I decided to go pink. This is an alizarin crimson. And then I have a purple overlay on it. And I'm starting to add texture now. You can see there's pink in the ear and the belly is forming its shadow because I'm taking the background and moving it up into the body of the rhino to help meld them together and to uh, just really form the contour of that belly. In this case, I believed that I used a wax medium, which I'm very fond of. You can't use it too thickly. So I put it on with a trowel, and then I pressed items with very fine texture into it, as you can see, and I also gouged it with the tip of the palette knife. So this pressed texture is only in two places on this rhino. It happens to be on the front of this knee, and there up on his forehead, and then Another layer of background, I build it up incrementally, and there's more purple brought into the, into the torso, and you can see I'm, I'm folding the edges of the rhino, melting him into the background. Now I've done a lot of palette knife work with a greenish gray along the back, and then this peachy color on his foreleg and his forehead and the hump on his back. You can't overwork it. You have to sort of cross your fingers and you can certainly do another layer. The la level of impasto I have means that I have to let it dry for a considerable amount of time between when I work on it. So now the yellow here is actually a painted texture. I haven't pressed anything to make those little grids. I have painted those little things, but they mimic some of the pressed in texture from other places. I put a mauve wash on the back, but you can see that there's yellow on the back too, at the top of that hump, just catching the light. The changes get more and more incremental as the painting nears completion because I sort of inch forward. I don't want to go back and have to redo things, so I bring in my shadow by inches. Here's a good look at the snout and all the, and the combination of textures. That's his knee in the background with the pressed and textured, but the gouged and the painted and the palette, it all smushes together. Here, really, all I'm doing is darkening the background more and the shadows. A 
I don't want to erase everything for sure. Now I'm focusing really on the highlights. And again, it's very incremental. And there we are, George, also known as Mumbles. A white rhino. And this is the professional photo I have taken. You can see how the colors shift. And thanks for the journey. Join me next month.